uh, hope you're, oh, meeting is being recorded, continue, yeah. Um, morning everybody, uh, my name is Stuart Coleman and I work for Cornwall Wallach Trust as a farm advisor for the Upstream Thinking Project, um, which is a, a quick word from our sponsors, it, it's funded by Southwest Water and we're one of several delivery partners over the Southwest, um, including West Country Rivers Trust, Devon Wildlife Trust, Exmoor National Park, etc. And, and it's involved with catchment management, uh, and particularly working with landowners um, in, and farmers in drinking water catchments. And I'll come on to that a bit in a moment. Um, each catchment, and in our case, that would be the drift catchment in Penwith. I'm responsible in the Cobra catchment, which is kind of between Helston, Local, and up at Four Lanes. And um, the College and Argyll catchments, which are the reservoirs which feed down uh, above Falmouth. Um, and we've also been involved as, as a wildlife trust, we're involved with other catchments as well. We've had involvement in Hale catchment, Bewed, Loon seeding catchments, etc. Um, sorry if I'm going to teach anybody how to suck eggs today. I don't know with the mix. I know some people on here will know what they're on about, and other people may not. So I'm just going to keep it pretty basic, and we're going to move quite fast, um, which for me is difficult because I normally like to talk the hind legs off a donkey. But I'll try and keep it fairly punchy. Um, so. I'm just going to drop over into another project quickly. This is a picture of a plan of the hail catchment. And um, just to get yourself orientated, there's some Ives, hail, and then down here's the south coast. So this is Mounts Bay here, there's Penzance, Helston's over here somewhere. And the concept of a catchment is basically as the, as the rain falls out of the sky and it hits the ground and the slope of the ground will make it run eventually to the sea. Um, some people will call them river basins. It's the same thing. It's not a polit political boundary. This will cross several parish councils here and you can see it crosses a, a quite big area of this part of Cornwall. Um, but the water of this side of the Helston to Penzance Road will be dropping south into Mounts Bay, but everything from this red line inwards is going that way. So any activity, any industry, any farming, any housing, anything that's going on in this area is going to hit a watercourse and eventually head out to the sea. Um, and in the case of um, the hail catchment, that obviously gets to hail estuary. You have this interchange between a full marine, marine environment and a freshwater environment. Depending on the size of it, that can be quite a big sort of mud flat area and estuary, which is kind of brackish. It's kind of got all fresh water coming in, marine water coming in and out in the tide. Usually very rich environment. Um, and it is the case in the hail catchment, which is a triple SI, very important for feeding birds, supports a load of inverts of interest, all sorts of good stuff. But it is not currently in good condition. And the reason for that is it's failing the Water Framework Directive, which is a standard for all water courses in Europe. Um, and it's failing on nitrates and macroalgae. And what that looks like in practice, close up, this is a quadrat on somebody's knees there, you can see they're doing a quadrat, is covered in green slime. That should be fairly clean, or as clean as you can get in an estuary, mud flat, silts and sediments. And this is covered in a load of green slop. And that's basically algae that's growing off the nutrients that are being fed into the system or, or too many nutrients that are being fed into the system. And it's been identified that that's human source. It's largely nitrates and it's largely coming from agriculture. So that's what the reality of what it looks like when, when things go wrong in a catchment. That's how it can change a system. Um, and how that looks from a satellite is when we had the famous floods for well, seem to be fairly regular floods now if you look at this image of the UK this brown stain that's coming out from the Bristol Channel and from the Thames and along the south coast this is soil this is runoff soil sediments coming off the land 
largely through agriculture and it is actually being deposited and, and pushed by chat by currents in the sea um, and this is a color enhanced picture of the same you can see how it's kind of ballooning it's kind of being pushed right up into the North Sea and right up into the Irish Sea it's hard to believe anything's actually growing in the Irish Sea it looks like it's getting a real battering um, if you look carefully along here on the Dutch coast it's actually relatively clean question mark you know maybe they're doing more precision farming maybe they're hanging on to their soils better maybe there's different ways of them managing their rivers I don't know I don't know much about the Dutch system but uh, we're certainly losing a lot of soil and there it is there's the proof as seen from space um, and if you want to take that to an extreme um, this you might not see it very well but that is the Mississippi Delta that is the um, the river catchment it is a river catchment for the whole of the Mississippi and I have some fascinating factoids for you here. the Mississippi catchment is 1,245,000 square miles it is the fourth biggest river catchment in the world 13 times bigger than the UK is that right that's the maths um, and the effect of what's going on in that river catchment is is uh, soils agriculture uh, huge agricultural area in the Midwest uh, that includes 32 states of the United States and two Canadian states in the Mississippi Delta unbelievable um, and it heads down to the coast and it exits here somewhere between Texas um, and I can't remember what the next uh, next one is actually I'll think about that um, the next state but it's basically pouring into the sea in, in the Gulf of Mexico and the effect of all the nutrients all the pesticides all the sediment that's being washed down in flooding is being deposited into the sea and you are getting a, um, an effect which is um, affecting the, the, the inshore environment, the localised sea environment and uh, you're basically getting loads of nutrients coming into the sea, the, the zooplankton is eating that and then it's obviously passing it through, it's all dropping down through the water column going down to the seabed where the microbes or the bacteria start acting on it and uh, eating it and using oxygen in the process and because of an effect in the sea with the temperature and salt you get this sort of line this um, barrier where which oxygen can't get through and the area underneath becomes anoxic or hypoxic uh, hypoxia it's called and anything in that environment dies basically and you've got this dead zone in the sea this is an extreme example of what's happening in a smaller way in the UK waters and I've got this picture of seagrass here because seagrass is a really good indicator of, of the health of what's going on in a catchment and what's being deposited out of it into the sea we've got seagrass for instance in Lou catchment and in Mounts Bay um, but it really does get affected by nutrients it doesn't like lots of nitrates because the and phosphates are the two main nutrients and sediments being deposited on top of it uh, because that stimulates the growth of algae the algae grows on the leaves of the seagrass and it actually nicks their light effectively it smothers them and makes them less able to grow um, and and they struggle and they're actually eventually killed off and we're losing seagrass as a international habitat of importance hand over fist it's really quite vulnerable and we need to sort that out it's a kind of a litmus test of how healthy the environment is and how healthy we're managing our water courses. Uh, another factoid for you, seagrass is over 30 times better at trapping atmospheric carbon than rainforest. How do they work that out? But that's, that's pretty impressive. So we really need to be looking after seagrass. There's all sorts of things living in it. Nursery for fish, feeding area, sorts out, um, sea acidification protects the coast from storm damage blah, blah 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 it's great stuff there you go so that started on the land causing a problem in the sea environment so that's kind of the connection and that's what a dead zone looks like from space there you go it's louisiana that was the one so it's texas and louisiana and you can see where the water's coming out from the catchments into the sea and that is a mass massive massive area and it's um that is human activity that's causing that so going smaller scale 
this is my patch uh, and several colleagues. Um, this is the cobra catchment or the upper part of the cobra catchment. This is the uh, the orange line is is the line of cobra. So this catchment here, this is Stythian's Lake, and that's going a different direction. That's eventually going down to Falmouth. But anything in this area is dropping down towards Helston um, and the sea ultimately. Um, so if you can imagine, the high ground is kind of around this edge. So this is where the moorland environment is we've got moorland remnants sort of heath mire boggy areas there's an example my colleague sue took a picture of this orchid here and you can see all cotton grass in the background this is a, like a mire environment on a on a um a area of remnant moor which is around here holds onto the water filters the water slowly releases it into the water environment and, and that water works its way down all these rivers and if you can see it, there's a little purple dot there. That is the uh, Trenere freshwater intake, the drinking water intake, which goes to the Wendron Waterworks. So anything that's going into the water here goes through to there and it's drawn from the river. In this case, some water, some waterworks draw from reservoirs, but this one's drawing from the river. And the cleaner we can make the water before it gets there, the better it is for the water company. It means they have to spend less on cleaning the water and getting all the nasties out of it, which could be nutrients, could be pesticides, could be pathogens, um, could be all sorts. Um, and the best way for us to do that is to work with landowners. The water doesn't stop there, of course, it carries on going and it goes down past Helston and gets to Low Pool. Now, Low Pool is unusual in so much as this would have been historically uh, an estuary environment but because of low bar it's got like this shingle bar which blocks the sea off largely apart from in storms but largely blocks it off so this is a freshwater environment it's a lake at the bottom of the catchment unlike hail which is a is a brackish estuary environment this is a freshwater environment it's a triple si it's really important but it's in a really bad state and the, and the main reason is because of the nutrients and sediments that are going into it. It's like a sump for everything, every mistake, every release of bad stuff in the, into the water courses ends up here. So that's another one of our drivers and the reason we've got funding in the Cobra, apart from Southwest Water, is um, because this needs to be protected and improved. So, as I said, I'm a farm advisor, so we've, we each team has a farm advisor and an ecologist and we have a water scientist who goes around doing sampling to make sure that any changes we make are actually improving the water or where the problems are uh, helps to direct us to our efforts and we've also got a practical team we have volunteers going out we've got officers who work with volunteers doing stuff so there's a team of us that works together i tend to deal with the farmy stuff so i tend to deal with the brown stuff in the fields and the brown stuff in the yard when i'll come back to that later nice field of cabbages um, nothing wrong with that per se, um, pretty stable as they're growing there in the environment, but the problem isn't here with the field of cabbages so much, it is what's happening around the field. So as you can imagine, you don't tend to harvest crops with helicopters or hovercraft, you tend to go in with tractors and where tractors move, uh, they compact ground and um, that will stop water filtering through that ground so water and anything on that field in rain will wash across the surface and it will actually come out and sure enough that winter it with lots of rain and we have plenty of rain in here in the southwest it turns it turns into a, a muddy soup very quickly and you can see the water moving down through these tracks and it just flushes straight out into the road, into the road drains and ditches and down towards watercourses. That will carry sediment, which is a problem in itself. The sediment will have phosphates. Any pesticides in this field will go with it, um, etc. So that's a real problem. Best thing to do in this case is we literally blocked it off with some funding. And you'll notice these logos will keep appearing and disappearing. It depends who was funding involved in us doing stuff. So we've literally moved how the how the tractors get into this field. They're now coming up on the flat on the top here rather than on the slope at the bottom of the field where everything exits. So we've literally got the farmer to put in some big stones, 
the volunteers have been involved to actually stone face this earth bank and the Cornish hedge as opposed to a, um, a dry stone wall actually has an earth core um, and then you have a stone face on it and usually uh, vegetated or, or um, grass top so uh, that makes it quite effective barrier for stopping runoff as we, as we call it leaving a field um, and in this case there you go that's nearly finished now so that was where we were looking before that was exiting onto the road and my van there you can see is where the road is um, and that's now blocked off and that's all now got a vegetative cap that's going to grow and for good measure we put a nectar mix in here as a, an additional buffer you can see they've had a field of barley here and there's a buffer of several meters of wildflowers and clovers etc which is really good for bees so we've now completely blocked that off and the, and the route way for pollution has been stopped. Keeps the soil in the field, keeps the nutrients in the field, keeps them out of the water course. Um, moving on to another crop, daffodils. Um, daffodils, quite frankly, is one of the banes of our lives. They, they are quite a high risk crop because they grow them in ridges. And you can see these ridges here and you can see the tractor wheelings. If that's on sloping ground, and, and somebody told me, frankly, half of Cornwall is sloping ground. So um, there is always an element of risk. Um, water onto that, and you can imagine everything starts moving. And in this case, the force of the water that's come down the edge of the field and along the field, over two fields, it's built up momentum, it's built up velocity. It scours the soil out, however well you cultivate that soil. And even if you put remedial measures on the soil to try and hold it together, um, some people put um, under sow bulbs with uh, barley, for instance, to try and hold the soil together. But the force of water is just too much. It scoured this out. That's over a foot deep, that gully. And you can see it when it's really flowing. I mean, that's the water's pouring through there and it's actually pouring out over the hedges, through the hedges, through rabbit holes, or even forces its way through a hedge in extreme cases. And it's just scouring out a track. And in this case, it's going into somebody's property causing flooding all this brownness this is soil and anything in the soil in the case of uh, bulbs that could be fungicides in there quite easily um, and that's all now heading down towards the watercourse so we have a lot of problems with um, bulbs another high risk crop would be potatoes another one would be maize these are these are crops which you have to say should they be put on high risk fields sloping fields is an example of something the environment agency has been trialing with some of the croppers they've actually um i mean that's quite a slope there you, but and they tend to do the gullies the um the ridges down the hill and that's not because it's they're stupid it's because the, the harvesting equipment can't work across the slope they can plow across the slope but you can't harvest they, they tend to be quite long vehicles and they can't do it so what they've done in this case is they've actually put in um, some daffodils um, contour planting instead so most of them are coming this way but when they get to the bottom they're going across the contour so the water's actually arrested in its movement it's actually got to go over the ridges and you can see here it's actually um, getting trapped in in the, the ridges and then it ho hopefully soaks in to the ground and also slows down its speed so that is helping but as I say, we have to ask the question, why are we planting bulbs on steep slopes? Discuss. Um, right, okay, so this is a cereal field. It's been harvested. I've been doing a bit of soil testing on here. It's one of the things I do to get the nutrients right, see what's in the field, make sure they're putting the right fertilizers and manures and what have you on the soil, not more than they need. Because if you put more than you need on a field, there's a risk of it going where you don't want it to be, either leaching through the soil in the case of nitrates, or going across the soil and into water courses. There's one down here, for instance, in the case of phosphates, and of course, any pesticides that are put on these fields. This is relatively stable. A stubble uh, uh, over winter on, on this ground is relatively stable. It's got a lot of root growth and, and, and vegetable matter there to help arrest some of the erosion, but you might start getting some problems where these wheelings are. You can see going down there, that might be a, a risky route way for water and might need to do some um, chisel ploughing down here to try and break the soil up a bit or you could put a cover crop and drill a cover crop into that to help 
but um, one of the things you can do with any crop and particularly with cereals is you can leave a buffer strip. This is a fairly modest one, but it's about four meters around the edge of the field. This is a spring barley crop that's gone in, just coming through. Um, just leave the grass rough, just let it grow. It's, it's a, it will, uh, anything that's flowing off here, it will, it will arrest it and, and uh, the nutrients will be used by the grass. And you've got another buffer here, you've got a hedgerow and a hedge bank. These are your lines of defense. If, if you can imagine this ground's all sloping down to the watercourse through there, if you rip that hedge out or you remove these buffers effectively, then you're asking for trouble because the velocity builds up, more water moves. And people do that for the, they're getting bigger tractors and then bigger equipment and they're trying to do it for economies of scale and efficiency and speed and what have you, but it causes problem. If you can keep these buffers in place, keep the hedges in place, they're your first line of defence. Not Note the, the obvious mistake farmers been using this for actually driving on, which is compacting the buffer, which is not good. You shouldn't be driving on that. Um, and it does go wrong. This is a field of um, rice cereal, um, ironically being grown for a biogas plant. That's another debate, um, growing crops to go in energy plants. We'll discuss that another time. But this has been done too soon. He cultivated this in January um, and he was asking for trouble. This is a field that had maize in it before and um, it's been de-stoned, de it's very silty, it's very free draining, but it's been compacted and it's lost its soil structure and, and the heavy rain in winter, it's um, the rain, the, the water has built up velocity again, as we said before, and it's literally gone through this field. I mean, that's over a foot deep and the soil has just gone pouring down there and the river is at the bottom here, at the bottom of the field. Luckily in this case, this, this field had a 20 odd meter buffer, which had been left uh, under stewardship, it was a, a stewardship option. And it's done its job. The, the silt has gone at least six meters, 20 feet into this buffer, but there is another 15, um, 14, 15 meters between it and the river. So it's done its job. Looks bad, it is bad. That soil's been effectively lost from the field, but we have stopped it going into the river. So we stopped a pollution incident by using a buffer. Buffers work, the bigger the buffer, the better. And going beyond buffers, you can actually use whole fields or field sections to act as a buffer. In this case, you can see the slope coming down here. This is uh, arable crops. And there's a whole big section of, of the field has been left. Uh, as a low input grass and it's not uh, by any means species rich it's not uh, like a, a wildflower meadow or anything but it does have some species interest if you look at the picture here on the, on the side the close-up you see these little holes that's voles when you leave grass to grow rough voles move in pretty quick they love that they tunnel underneath so there'll be hundreds of voles in this area and that in turn will be hunted by owls and kestrels etc so you know it's doing a job, it's buffering the field, and it's also providing a habitat. Um, just to interrupt you one second, Stuart, just doing a time check. Um, we've been about 20 minutes. Right on. Okay, so um, grassland, we've got a lot of grassland in the southwest. It's a big livestock area. We grow grass very well. It's relatively warm, it's relatively wet. So we grow a lot of grass. The trouble is if you keep your cows or other livestock out on the fields in winter, you quickly turn your fields into a paddy field. And this is a case of a really bad example of, of poaching and, and surface damage to a field. It's turned into like a mud soup here. Um, and you can imagine if that's on a slope or water gets it onto that heavy rain, that starts to move. And in this case, it was starting to move down towards uh, one of the tributaries of the upper Cobra. Um, the added problem here is the cows have been marching down this field and they've punched a hole through this hedge bank to get to the water and they've been drinking in the water course. Um, and so anything in that field, any manure, any fertilizer and the soil itself is washing through that gap and it's going straight into the water course and causing problems. In this case, however, we've got our team of volunteers and uh, they've rebuilt the, the hedge bank. Uh, they've, you see the earth core in the middle. This is how you start to build one. You have your, your stone grounders on the sides and you build up the sides. There's the river behind them there, look. And there they are with a completed wall, looking very pleased with themselves and quite right too. That's a good job done. That's a, that's a historic landscape feature. 
it's um, it's doing a job of stopping uh, runoff going into the river, stopping the cows going in the river, um, and great satisfaction for the volunteers. That's a skill you can learn if you want to come out with us and do some volunteering with us. A lot of people now are quite proficient at doing hedge building. Join us. Um, it is another grass and this is an intensive grass and believe it or not out of picture to the right is a, is a slope of intensive grass and but down the bottom here there's a water course in amongst these trees this is um a thin strip of uh, effectively rush pasture it's like a wetland grass wet grass and environment it's full of, of wildflowers insects of all sorts there'll be nest ground nesting birds and birds feeding in it so a relatively small feature like that can be a natural buffer and have wildlife value that could go into stewardship it would support well there you go there's there's um angelica and all sorts of umbellifers there's uh devil's bit scabious bees using them and other pollinators so you can have a relatively small feature which supports wildlife and the features can be quite big again in a wetland environment trees shrubs um scrub encroaching here you've got all sorts of willows and gorse etc and like a rushy miry environment in here got some volunteers doing some work because this area is effectively blocked off from cattle cattle can't go in here and that's about a 40 meter buffer the water course is just down here in the trees so a natural feature acting as a, a natural buffer to nutrients and pollutants of all sorts we can create a buffer if there isn't one there already this field here had cows mooching around and, and going into the water course which is coming around this edge they were coming straight across into this small tiny tiny area of field which really didn't have any food value for them but they were causing loads of problems walking through the river and doing their business as they went so we've literally fenced that off and we've planted it up with trees and we've got a small copse of trees there that's the volunteers involved again and where this hedge bank is here just on the other side of it we did some more planting so where we were looking before is just over that hedge bank and we've done some more tree planting here this was a different problem this was a, a grass and where there wasn't cows but there was runoff coming down towards this hedge and then straight into the river so we've effectively blocked this off and the best way to show you is from a drone picture that's where we were this is looking from above imagine this all sloping down and it was just running straight into the river here's the river and there was another water course here behind the hedge so this is the other area of planting so we've effectively put in about, mm, about 150 trees over the two sites um, created a small copse and that will increasingly improve uh, the buffering of pollutants going into the water course and in time it will help with flood mitigation as well because it will arrest the flow of water and it will hold the water in the upper catchment better so that's what we would call natural flood management method um, Yes, you could fence it off and you could let it regenerate itself with trees if this was beside a wood, but in case of t we haven't got time in some places, we need to deal with the problem now. So we do do some tree planting. I think there's, a, there's room for both. Right, cows, there's a cow. Jen likes cows, there's a cow for you. Right, so that looks okay, it's sloping. This is not far from Helston. Sloping, improved grassland. It's a monoculture of grass and mainly rye grass. Um, which dairy guys like, or dairy farmers like, because um, it, they, they respond well to nitrates. They can grow, say, two, three cuts of silage off it and grazing, um, very responsive. But they are shallow rooted grass and they are prone to dying back quite badly in the winter. Um, and sometimes you can have 25, 30% bare ground actually within the grass sward. And you can imagine heavy rain on that, especially if it's being compacted by vehicles or, or cows. Cows are typically two thirds, three quarters of a ton each. Um, they will cause a lot of damage to the topsoil and that in turn can cause problems with runoff. So one of the things we're looking at, and this is a slide from Cotswold Seeds, who are involved in this, is we're looking at soil health as well, soil structure. And it's not just about how you cultivate it with machinery, it's also about the plants you choose. If you look here, these are the rye grasses. Look how shallow those roots are. But if you look at some of these other grasses like Coxfoot, Timothy, Meadow Fescue, much deeper rooting. And then look at some of these legumes, so-called legumes, which is your clovers, your veggies, the nitrogen fixing plants, really deep roots. 
Um, and here's another one is chicory, it's a different sort of plant again. Look at the deep roots. So you need to think of not just what's growing on the top of the, of the ground, you need to go think what's growing underneath as well. It's very much a three dimensional and above and below ground. If you can increase the complexity and depth of the roots under the surface of the soil, you improve the, the water percolating down into the soil during heavy rain. Um, and similarly, any slurries or, or fertilizers that are put on the top and it's utilized better underneath the ground. Um, effectively, if the nitrates go beyond these roots, they're lost and they leach to the water table and they're gone. So if you've got other plants with deeper roots, they can catch those nutrients on the way down. And you have much more effective use of nutrients. And similarly, when grasses and plants are cut or grazed, <coughs> they, um, the roots die back a bit and that dead root matter it becomes organic matter that's, that's effectively built up in the soil. Uh, and it encourages all sorts of inverts. Uh, we think of earthworms, but there's all sorts of inverts under the soil doing their thing. And that encourages that, helps fix carbon in the soil, um, helps aerate the soil, stops flooding, all good. Um, and this is what it can look like. And if you do it in, uh, take it to its extreme, if you like, we're now looking quite seriously at, this is a trial field. We're doing um, what they call herbal lays or herb rich lays. So you've got multiple grasses, and you've also got lots of different herbs. These uh, are clovers, red clovers or aziki clovers. These are the chicory plants here, the tall blue ones. Um, not just for looking pretty and for supporting lots of insects, which they do, as that's actually buzzing with, with wildlife in the, in the summer, but um, good eating too, because there's uh, good proteins, good minerals for the health of the livestock. Um, and as we said, it, it's, it improves the soil structure um there you go it's almost hard to believe how much growth is there and that didn't have any fertilizers that had some muck put in the seed bed when it was put in but this was uh, 18 months later and it was still growing that was as tall as me some of this um absolutely amazing um the, the hardest barrier to this is actually getting the farmers to believe it's a good thing they kind of look at it and think it's gone out of control but the taste challenge the cows love it they eat the lot once they've sussed it, it, it what it is they love it and they eat it and they absolutely strip the leaves off the chicory and there you go, the bees like it too. So what do I know? They know. Okay, moving on, cows, nice pastoral scene. Here's the cows all coming down out of the sheds, mooching down the hill towards the river to drink. Oh dear, Bessie's been in the river. First thing she does after she's had a drink is she's going to release what's ever inside her as well. And that brown chestnutty color is indeed what you think it is. And if you imagine there's dozens of animals going into the watercourse, releasing themselves into the watercourse that is now moving down towards the drinking water intake that's possibly moving down towards another farm where the cows are drinking that's possibly moving down towards an area where kids are paddling and ultimately it'll be going down to the beach and the sea um, with all its nutrients and its pathogens and it's possibly its pharmaceuticals like wormers and, and anything else that's in that cow is now in the water and also the cow, and it's not just cows, it's horses, it's any livestock, uh, going down to the river, it's, it's causing erosion, it's causing breaking down of the banks, and then all the sediments released into the water, and that's your phosphates, and then the sediment itself. And that's causing problems for fish, brown trout, for instance, they need um, clean streams and gravels for spawning, and uh, all this sediment coming down is causing them problems. So the obvious thing to do, and we do a lot of it, is fence the river off. Um, in this case, it's an electric fence, but we can do uh, wire fencing. You literally keep the cow out of the water course um, and it works. And similarly, there is an animal welfare issue here as well. The cows need something to drink. So you give them alternative drinking. Uh, in this case, we got some funding. We put in a, a concrete pad and um, some drinking troughs. These were ones that are fed from a well could come from mains water supply, could come from rainwater harvesting, but it's keeping the animals out of the river. That makes a real difference. And we've done many kilometers of fencing now to keep uh, animals out of water courses. <clears throat> Here's another example. Here's a, it's not easy to see, but there's a stream coming down through here. And it, this is a Ford, tractors going through there, cows are going through there, cows are standing around in here in, in the hot weather uh, and doing their business. We've replaced that with a big concrete pad and there's a culvert now going underneath and a gate to keep the cows out once they've gone through. 
might look a bit ugly, but that really does get the goods in terms of stopping erosion and pollutants being deposited into the river. Those are the sort of things we can do. Right, on to the yard now. Sorry, How long we got? You again, about 10 minutes left. Lovely. Right, so we're moving into the yard now. Um, this is a dairy. As you can see, there's lots of Frisians here, or Holsteins, I think they're British Frisians, those ones. Um, cows do lots of this. Um, it's what it looks like, um, and they're doing it all day. Um, and these ones are waiting to be milked, so this is what we call a loafing yard. They're waiting around to, for milking. Um, there's no roof, so as soon as it rains, this lot is going to start going mobile, uh, even if it's scraped. Um, and you can't scrape all day, every day. You, you tend to scrape the yards once a day. Um, and if this is here before it's been scraped and you get rain, this is all going to start moving towards drains or watercourses or down tracks, places it shouldn't be going. So the obvious thing is stick a roof over it. That's the same place with the roof put over it. And um, you've still got mess underneath the roof, but the difference is now that that's not getting rain hitting it. So the farmer can scrape it and deal with it and put it in the right place, like in the slurry store, rather than it going down towards the drains. It's what we call clean and dirty water separation. So if rain hits a roof and it goes into the gutters and the gutters go down to a clean water drain, it can go straight in the river. That's not a problem. As soon as it hits a surface, it becomes dirty water, either, either lightly flowered or, or right through to slurry, depending how mucky it is. And um, we try and keep that out of the water courses. It's one of our biggest spends in terms of farm support. We put grant money in towards uh, infrastructure on farms. Farmer puts some money in as well. Uh, it takes the sting out of the investment. Um, and it gets the goods. It really does make a difference for water courses. Um, here, here's another example, silage. This is a tail of two silage clamps. So here's one, typical one. This is the cut grass. It's put underneath a big tarpaulin, uh, weighted down with tires, and this is then ensiled. It's like sort of fermented. It's, 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 it's broken down. It cooks in the heat. And it turns it into their winter fodder um, for when they're not out on the fields. But the leachate that can come out of that when it's in siling is, um, is like rocket fuel. It's really strong stuff. And if that heads down on an open um, with rain, if it heads down towards a drain and that gets into a river, it causes real problems. But what you can do is you can put a roof over that too. So this is all nice, relatively clean now. The rain doesn't get on that anymore. Um, concrete walls around it. So it's kept all nice and clean. The fodder's improved. Um, and and he's greatly reduced the amount of water going down towards his slurry stores as well, which means he's got less slurry to spread because it's all captured in gutters and goes into a clean water drain and then into the river. That again has really improved the quality of the river. Uh, muck, farmyard manure, and this is not just cattle. This could be any animal where you've got bedding and muck mixed. It could be horses, could be a livery, for instance. I've seen some pretty massive heaps. Now, sometimes farmers, because they haven't got space within their animal housing, they'll, they'll literally scrape that up and put that out into a field as a field heap. But look at what's coming out of it. And this is a, a covered heap. Loads of leachate coming out of here. That's nutrients. That's good stuff. But if it gets into water course, it, it, it will cause havoc. It's really strong. So getting a roof over this means that this stays drier, which means it stays hotter, which means it composts better, breaks down weed seeds and, and kills off pathogens. And, and it also means that the farmer's got more control. He can put that muck out when he needs to on a crop rather than when he has to because he's forced to because he's got too much mess. So it's about controlling better use of manures better timing and controlling any leachate that's coming out of it. <clears throat> it's not just organic materials that are problems in the yard. Here you go. Um, this is a diesel oil tank. Uh, this is an old diesel oil tank. There are regulations which, which cover how you store diesels on a farm. Um, but if they're older than a certain age, they're exempt. I don't understand the logic of that. This tank could be decades old it's an old galvanized tank but it could be very near rotting out um, from the inside and it's got what 1200 1500 liters of diesel in there that's a clean water drain this is a <laughs> this is a horror show here this should be bunded 
um, and in a new tank, it's a plastic skin tank, it will be a double walled, a self bunded tank, which means if it does get breached, it should hold a spill. But this one won't. This And look, what else have you got here? You've got an oil drum, God knows what's in that. You've got a several years collection of oil filters from self servicing. I mean, this is just shocking. And if that goes, it's going straight into that drain and straight down the water course. Room for improvement, Mr. Farmer. Um, and this one here is a, a typical chemical store. Now, in theory, you could have a whole gamut of different sorts of um, fertilizers, uh, not fertilizers, uh, pesticides um, within a, your chemical store, depending on how you're farming. Um, some of them could have been in there for years, leftovers. Um, the snails have eaten all the labels off. You don't know what's in there. You don't know, you don't know what it is anymore. Some of them might even be banned. You find a real Aladdin's cave of nasties within a chemical store. In theory, it should be within a, a chemical store safe, which again means if there's any spillage, it's, it's, um, it's secure and similarly people can't get at it. So it's not just when, first, uh, when uh, pesticides are sprayed on the fields that they're a risk, it's how they're stored how they're loaded into the tractor. I mean, sometimes people will be loading pesticides into a tractor and if they have a spill, it could go into a drain. So, you know, we need to get them stored right. We need to reduce their use ideally, but we need to get them stored right and we need to make sure, um, we, we offer amnesties for instance. So um, old banned chemicals or out of date chemicals can actually be taken away. So they don't get into water courses. It's one of the things we can do. Um, and it's not just farmland. I'm moving on to a slightly different area now, Jen. I'm sort of winding it down now. So we're outside farming. There's other land uses and other historic land uses. And um, we've got plenty of mining in Cornwall and, and in the south, in the west of Cornwall. And in the Cobra is no different. There's lots of mining in the Cobra catchment. And this is what happens if um, there's often water addict, coming out of addicts all the time of mines. But they're, if they're if they're disused mines they're not disturbed they're okay they, all the sediments have settled but as soon as somebody in this case has been poking around in the mine the sediment has just been released and and you've got something which like looks like milk it's not unlike china clay waste coming out they're really really fine sediments and it just comes out as a cloud into the water course that's going to really be bad news for any fish in there they're going to have to move fast um, and any other wildlife and that's heading down towards the water intake for drinking water as well Nasty. Right, moving on to more human um, interaction with, with watercourses within the catchment. Of course, we live here too. It's not just about farming, it's not just about industry, it's about living. And typically, houses, uh, that, thanks to Ian Barker for some pictures from the Lou Bathing Water Project here, um, typically you've got um, clean water, um, so, so from gutters, etc., and, and garden drains going into your, your clean surface water sewers, which probably go to an, a local stream or ditch, or straight into a, a, a estuary or the sea even. And you have your foul water, which is your bath water, your washing machine, your toilet, etc., going into foul water. Now, as you might imagine, if there's any misconnections things being plumbed into the wrong pipes um well work it out for yourself where that's going to go um and in a rural context if you don't have main sewage sewage um you probably have some kind of septic tank and um, there are rules and govern and governance and licensing for those through the environment agency but it is the responsibility of the homeowner to make sure that their system is working and is emptied regularly because if it gets blocked or it overflows or it's going into a soak away, which um, is beside a pond or beside a water course, we have several incidences in the Cobra uh, where it's actually human waste, which is causing the pollution in water. Um, yeah, it's a real problem. And similarly, misconnections, you can see this pipe's going into a water course, but this here is sewage fungus and it's telling you that it shouldn't be going straight into a water course. That should have gone. That might be a misconnection problem. Um, that's showing you that there's nasties going into that and, and grease coming out of food processing places or restaurants, pubs, cafes, or from your kitchen sink. Sorry if you just had your breakfast. Uh, fats, oils, and greases—they will block up 
um, rural drains just as much as the fat bergs you see in um, cities. They and that will cause sewage to back up potentially and go straight into watercourses. So we have a responsibility as well. It's not just farmers. We're not bashing the farmers here. Is we all are in water catchments ultimately and and what we do affects what goes into the water this is just a no-brainer this is so simple this is real community action and and awareness raising education mainly with kids get them to paint yellow fish on the drains here the road drains which are going straight into water courses or the sea only rain down the drain you can't forget that that's really easy it's really effective i think it's great fun um, and uh, I think we need to be doing a lot more of that in all catchments. It's just such a it's such a good thing to do. And finally, um, so you may feel slightly more empowered. Um, there are a number of problems facing our water environment and ultimately the sea. Um, and if you see it, you can report it. This is the instant hotline. Um, it's 24 hour service, ring that number 0800 80 70 60 if you see anything that's wrong, whether it's soil runoff, whether it's um, muck going into a water course, whether you can smell sewage, if there's a, a flooding problem, if, if something's pouring into the road. In this case, that picture I showed you before, this mine waste, this was reported by somebody who lived nearby. Um, and the Environment Agency are duty bound to respond. Um, may not always end up being a prosecution, that's not really the, the main point of this, this isn't about dobbing people in so much, this is about solving problems. And uh, they got in, then got in touch with us and we dealt with the, the landowner who had the mine <coughs> and we've largely stopped this happening now. So this works, This, if you make a call it gets logged and an officer from the Environment Agency is duty bound to go out and check out what's going on. So this is another first line of defence. You, you are our eyes and ears effectively out in the catchments. So you can um, make a real positive contribution. And that's me. We're done. OK. That's fab. Thanks, Stuart. That was brilliant. <coughs> Thank happy you. to take questions. Cool. Are you happy to stop sharing your screen for a moment? Is that OK? Yeah. Thank you. And then I'll be able to see. So yeah, so does anybody have, oh, sorry, I'm just having a... Anybody uh, still awake? Yeah, everyone. <laughs> I thought that was brilliant. Thank you very much. That was really interesting. Um, does anyone have any questions they'd like to put um, to Stuart? Dan, sorry about the mix up before Dan, but I've got... Oh, not at all. Uh, thank you, Stuart. Enjoyed that a lot. <laughs> sorry, missed the start. But, um... Yeah, I didn't know so much work went into protecting the, uh, the waterways. It looks incredibly good. Well, I mean, I mainly deal with the, the agricultural side of it, but um, I brought that other stuff in because it, it's not just about farming. Farming does make quite a big contribution to freshwater pollution and ultimately sea pollution, but it's certainly not the only one. Um, we all live in river catchments, and I think once people start getting their head round the idea of a water catchment and wherever anything hits the surface and starts to run away it's going to ultimately end up in the sea one way or another most of it <laughs> yeah yeah well fantastic to know um i had a question about um oh excuse me there was a slide with the volunteers making the stone wall <laughs> yes uh, that looked fantastic i've been trying to make a stone wall in my garden but um haven't had much luck <laughs> Uh, yeah, there's all sorts of dark arts to how you do it. You've got to get the <laughs> angle right uh, so that the, the wall pushes inwards um, into the earth core. And you need to, if you just put it straight, it wants to fall out. So you need to angle it so it put, presses in. Makes a lot of sense. Um, but yeah, we can teach you how to do it. If you've got some spare time, we, it, each catchment has its team. And uh, when we're doing wall building, join in. Uh, we, can, we put out an itinerary of what tasks we've got coming up. So if you fancy giving a go. It's a good skill to learn. It really Brilliant. is. Yeah, could I um just ping you an email for that, and you can direct me towards, or is there a, no problem? Uh, yes, certainly. Stuart Coleman at Cornwall Wildlife Trust. dot org dot uk. Lovely. See okay. <laughs> I think Jen's going to put this presentation on YouTube, so if you you can always um get it later as well. So.
Oh, fantastic. Thanks. Yeah. I'll, I'll give us a message as well, Dan, on, on Facebook and we can send you as well. Uh, but you know, it will be going up on, on YouTube. Does anyone else have any other questions or comments they'd like to put to Stuart? We have had one lady has left. She's had to go, Gwen, but she's just said how much she's enjoyed the talk. Cool. And, um, it wasn't out of disgust then. She didn't leave. No, I was... she did say that she's going to email you because she'd like to volunteer. Oh, cool. Yeah. Oh, well, as I say, each catchment has a team of volunteers um, and, and there are plenty of other volunteer a activities across the county as well. So wherever you are, we can either through uh, sort of land based or marine. There's plenty of volunteer activity out, out there. Get involved. And we've had a comment from Jenna who said, good geography class. I've told people about it going on YouTube. Can you help us stop housing developments in Penryn? Personally, no. But um, it is an issue. Every bit of concrete that's laid, every building, uh, you know, every change in land use, whatever it is, it's going to have an effect one way or another. The rain's not going to stop coming out of the sky. And, and with climate change, we're getting more and more extreme rainfall events. And um, there's implications for flooding. There's implications for runoff pollution. Um, there are implications for drinking water as well, because it's not just about too much water. We've only just last few weeks we've only just come out of a, effectively a drought yeah. um, we're getting more erratic weather so we need to hold the water up in the catchment as well we seem to be one of the few countries that's obsessed with getting water shifted off the land and down towards the sea as quickly as possible half the world's crying out for water it's it's crazy really we need to rethink water and if we can rethink water then we can start to address some of the pollution problems as well you got a thumbs up from jenna then um, cool. Yeah, any other questions or comments for Stuart? That's cool. Well, thanks. Stunned into you. silence. <laughs> good though, it's good. Everyone's absorbing the information. Like I was yesterday when we did the dry run and it took me a while after, then I was just like, yeah. I was discussing it with my partner after as well for quite some time. Well, I mean, as I said, that, that, that was a, a very fast move across a very complex subject and there was loads more stuff I could have done um you know there's loads of reading around the subject to do it I mean I'd learned some stuff getting ready for this about seagrass and I was thinking how much the farming affects that so it really is interconnected it's the quite holistic approach to it all and it's literally more to shore that's why I kind of coined that phrase it's uh, because it starts at the top and it works its way down and anything that picks up on the way is going to have an effect. Yeah. So yeah. We're all guilty, if you like, and we're yeah. all involved. We, and we all potentially could be part of the solution as well. Yeah, definitely. Cool. Well, unless there's any more comments or anything, we'll, um, we'll stop for today. Daniel? Just a quick one on the uh, volunteering. Um, the, at the moment, a lot of our vo volunteering is oh, yeah. fine. Um, just because our practical officers uh, furloughed and their volunteers can't come together at the moment, but there's loads of information on the Cornwall Wildlife Trust um, website for that. Fab, thank you. Yeah, that's a fair point, Daniel. We're, normally we go out most weeks of the year, but at the moment it's, a, it's been affected by corona along with the rest of us. Yeah. Um, and they're itching to get back out. I've had quite a lot of contact from the volunteers and they're itching to get back out again and yeah. get on with really stuff cool. and there's plenty to do. <laughs> definitely can relate to that feeling for sure yeah cool well thank you very much uh daniel you just said oh you sent through some information to me that's fab i'll copy that so i can pop it i'll be able to download the transcript well thank you very much for joining us everyone and uh if you do have any more questions or anything hopefully you've got Stuart's email or you can email me or send us a message on facebook and we will pass it on to Stuart. So thanks, Jen. Thanks, Stuart. Bye. Round of applause from everyone. Thank you. Stay safe, everyone. Yeah, Thank you. you too. Thanks, Jen. That was great. Bye. Bye.